I'd like you to turn in your Bibles tonight to the book of Genesis chapter number 2. We continue a series that we began recently entitled Foundations, Back to the Beginning, and we want to continue our study in Genesis chapter number 2. There are many questions that remain unanswered regarding the status of things prior to sin ever entering the world. There were only two people who had the opportunity to actually be able to live in that time frame, and those two people passed away a long time ago. Uh, a man by the name of Adam and his wife Eve. I cannot imagine how creation was and what the world was actually like in a time when sin had not affected all of creation. We happen to today still encounter a variety of questions and admittedly most of those questions remain unanswered. I've mentioned this repeatedly, but I believe it is important and needs to be mentioned again that the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis are more than a simple scientific record of the origin of things. That is not to discredit the ministries and so forth that have done an excellent job of defending these passages of Scripture from a scriptural standpoint and so forth, but we cannot merely look at it from a scriptural standpoint and lose the theological part of it. This is, in fact, a part of the Word of God, and it is describing in greater detail for us how the nation of Israel came into existence. The focus of the book of Genesis is largely on the beginning of the nation of Israel and how it overcame the threats to the promised seed through Abraham. As you go through it, there are many different threats that appear that could very well, if not handled correctly, wipe out Israel and this entire concept of a new nation. One of those threats was the fact that there was no seed, <laughs> okay? Another threat was in Genesis 23 when God told, uh, told Abraham to offer his son Isaac upon an altar. Uh, there are lots of these things. What would happen when they lived in the land of Egypt and, and how would God use all of these things? That's the book of Genesis. And so there's a theological emphasis in it. But it also takes us and it reminds us of what God's original design was for mankind. How God originally created things and how sin has entered the world and has created such a mess of things. Let me tell you that sin never equates to improvement. Never. The person is not going to be better off who chooses to live a life rebellious of God's instruction and rebellious of God's commands. It will always lead in heartache. The Bible teaches that the way of the transgressor is hard. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. God will bless those who choose to honor him and obey him, and he will punish those who choose to disobey him. The word of God is filled with examples of it, and it begins all the way back here uh, at the very beginning. Even in God's judgments within the nation of Israel, and we could examine their entire history, we would find that there are periods of time where it appeared as though the nation of Israel could very well be extinct, but God has promised that will never take place. It doesn't matter what regime might try to attack them. The Bible has already settled the matter. Israel is God's chosen nation. Those nations who choose to bless Israel will be blessed. Those who choose to curse Israel will be cursed. That is a law that God himself has designed, and it is unalterable. As great as America is, I can assure you that if we side against Israel, God will judge this land without fail. It is vital that we maintain a good policy with Israel, that we pray that our leaders do so as believers. There are things we can do. Regardless of your political stand, uh, it is irrelevant. There are things as believers that we are expected to do, and one of those things is to pray for our leaders, do so faithfully, that God would lead them. It is possible that God could use a pagan king, such as a man by the name of Cyrus, to issue a decree that would allow the Jews to return back to their homeland. In fact, he even funded the project. <laughs> uh, God does these things, okay? And uh, God's people 
people need to be very faithful in that. We begin our study in Genesis 2. We actually covered the first three verses last time as we finished chapter number 1, where the Bible says in verse 4, These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heaven. And we're going to talk tonight about unprecedented beauty and innocence. What was life like before sin? There's a phrase that we will see repeatedly, or a similar phrase, and that phrase is, these are the generations of. It is a phrase that is going to go throughout the book of Genesis, and it is going to take us into, at times, names we can't pronounce and individuals we will not recognize. But it provides us with a framework whereby the book of Genesis is able to be evaluated and examined. And by and large, we will use this as a framework as we go throughout it. You'll find that phrase by itself will actually create 10 different divisions. Uh, we will throw the first one on just for sake of covering all of the verses. The first section that we'll deal with that we've already dealt with is found in chapter 1 and verse 1 through chapter 2 and verse 3, and that is the account of creation. Beginning in chapter 2 and verse 4 and continuing down through chapter 4 and verse 26, we will deal with another aspect, and that is the creation of humanity, uh, the Garden of Eden, as well as the fall. Chapter 5 and verse number 1, you'll see the phrase, these are the generations of Adam. And it will continue down through chapter 6 and verse number 8. Then beginning in chapter 6 and verse 9 and continuing through the end of chapter 9, you will find that these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man. And it will deal with everything that relates to Noah, and obviously the vast majority of it is Noah and the flood, even though he was a man who lived for several hundred years. <clears throat> Chapter number 10 will state this is the generations of the sons of Noah, and will include down through into the middle of chapter 11, the Tower of Babel. Towards the end of chapter 11, chapter, 10, uh, chapter 11, verse 10 through verse 26, we'll see the account of Shem's family. Chapter 11, verse 27, all the way through chapter 25 is really the account of Terah's family. Who is that? The father of Abraham. And then we'll also be related then with Lot. Genesis 25, verse 19 through 35, verse 29 will deal with the account. I'm sorry, chapter 25, verse 12 through 25, 18 is the account of Ishmael's family. Then verse 19 through chapter 35 is the account of Isaac's family. Our emphasis will be put on Jacob and Esau. Chapter 36 and verse 1 through chapter 37, verse 1 will be the account of Esau's family. And then from 37 on through the end of chapter 50 is the account of Jacob's family, mostly dealing with Joseph. Not exclusively, but mostly. And that gives us kind of a, a framework, a skeleton. We'll come back to this. It's not necessary uh, that you keep this in mind. You won't be tested over it or anything like that. Uh, your tithe is not contingent upon knowledge of this, all right? And so we'll press on. But these are the generations of, in other words, this is what became of. And that's the, the focus of it. And so Moses, in writing this, says, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. This is what became of the heavens and the earth when they were created. We're going back and recounting what has already been stated in chapter number one and what we'll ultimately see is that sin entered the world and all of creation was adversely affected. That's what became of creation. What became of creation was the reality of death, something that God never intended and that God warned against. And we'll read in chapter 5, so-and-so begat so-and-so, and he lived for so many hundred years, and he died. So-and-so begat so-and-so, lived so many years, and he died. So-and-so, and that repetition continues and continues and continues. Why? Because it is a very stark reminder of the reality of sin. It was the result of Adam and Eve's willful disobedience to a very clear command of God and we will see then in this section what it is that happened to humanity what happened to the Garden of Eden and what are the clear consequences of the fall this was something that was never God's plan much of the focus in Genesis chapter 2 is on how things were prior to the fall and it is a contrast as I've alluded to to which we are largely unable to relate 
even the most beautiful things that we have seen. And if you've had opportunity to travel across the country or travel to various locations, without a doubt, you have seen some very beautiful sights. But even those things have still been adversely affected by sin. We live in a world that has bears the marks of a worldwide flood. It is not what God originally created. As beautiful as some of those sights see, this place that we will describe in Genesis 2 is unlike anything you and I have ever witnessed. The animals and mankind do not share the same relationship they once enjoyed before sin ever entered the world. The details of Genesis 2, which would include things such as the location of the Garden of Eden, the dimensions of it, and all of those things are, to be quite honest, unable to be determined with precision, and they often sidetrack us from what I believe is the theological point that Moses is seeking to make. It doesn't matter if you can figure out exactly how many square miles the Garden of Eden was. That's not the point of this passage. Well, where was it located? We can speculate. It doesn't matter. That's not the point of the passage. The point that has to remain in the forefront of our minds is the reality of sin and its consequences. Sin never improves society or individuals, but instead always results in God's chastening hand. So let's go back and look and see what things were actually like before sin ever entered the world. We begin by noticing the position of man stated in verses 4 through 7. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. This is a very similar to um, chapter 1 as it began where there was an introduction followed by some clauses and then there is a narrative begin. So verse 4 describes a time when there was no life. Uh, the Bible says a time before there was the growth of plants, before there was rain, and before there was even man to cultivate the ground. Verse 5, every plant of the field before it was in the earth, every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. The word mist does not necessarily suggest that there is a, uh, this neat little misting spray that is going all over everything, but it would instead suggest a, a subterranean stream of fresh water. Uh, it would be very equivalent to groundwater. When the Bible talks in the flood account, it will talk about the fountains of the deep being broken up, uh, and this would be that subterranean water that would have been under there. This was how God designed it. Now, do you think it was a beautiful sight? I guarantee it was. Something that was far beyond anything that you and I would be able to relate to. And so then he goes into the narrative of the creation of man because that by far is going to be the most important aspect of it. We can't have a nation of Israel if we don't talk about how mankind came into existence. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. There's a great deal of care in forming and fashioning man out of the dust of the ground. The word is not the same as the word translated create, but it is the word that is often used to describe a potter forming a vessel from the clay. The idea is that there was mankind is, is almost a, a representation of the work of an artist and what a work it truly is. God formed man from the dust of the ground. Man was made by God for a very specific purpose. He was carefully and uniquely designed by God. Every feature of man, including today, attests to the glory of God, and your whole being is designed to go and accomplish God's divine purpose on this earth. You have been fashioned in the exact way that God wanted. You might not like certain features, but that was how God designed you. Your nose might be too big, it might be too small. It might be one that a ski slope could jump, a ski jumper could take off of uh, and go down the hill. Who knows what that nose truly is, but you know what? It's exactly how God designed it. 
color of the eyes, the color of the hair, the lack of the hair, whatever the case is, this is how God designed you. The psalmist reflected on this and stated in Psalm 139, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My body reflects the work of an artist. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. God knew exactly what I would look like before any image would ever capture it. God knew. God designed it that way. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, in spite of the fact that at one point in time I was little more than a glob, God knew exactly what this glob would look like. And if you've ever seen the development of a child, it is amazing to see. God knows that. In thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. But I will praise thee, Amen. because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Folks, you have been designed by God himself. Amen. You have not been designed, however, in order for you to achieve and accomplish your own will and your own agenda. You've not been placed here on this earth to do whatever you want to do to fulfill your desires. You've been placed here by God for a very specific reason. And God has a very specific plan for your life. I do believe the will of God is specific in its nature. And I don't think it's just this general vague thing that you get to just pick and choose whatever you want to pick and choose uh, among a list of things. I think God's better than that. God is not a, a vague pick and choose kind of God. He's very specific, very orderly, and very detailed. And I think that his will is that. Can I encourage you to just follow it? Submit yourself to it. God knows what he's doing. God has this all worked out. Just let him do. And if he chose to make this vessel in this fashion and in this regard, then praise be to God. Take a look at, from a medical standpoint, how your body functions. And it is a praise to God. Can I tell you, while you're enjoying good health, thank God for it. Because he's the one who gives it. And if you are not enjoying good health, thank God for it. Because he's the one who allows it. The challenges can be great. But thank God for how he's designed it. The Bible says that God then breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The result was that he took and transformed this lump of clay, so to speak, into a living soul. God made man a spiritual being, the capacity to be able to serve and fellowship with God. No other aspect of creation was given this kind of a lofty position of man. Animals were given life, but they are incapable of worshiping God. There's a dimension that man has that does not characterize any other aspect of creation. You are placed in a unique place that is superior to all of creation. But with every privilege comes responsibility. That unique place to which you have been put, comes with some unique responsibilities. And ultimately, that responsibility is to glorify God. We see not only the position of man, but secondly, we also see the provision for man. Look at the garden that God placed him in. Verse 8, the Bible says, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. I don't know if you all planted a garden or not this year. If you did, it was a lot of work. I can assure you of that. We planted one. I can assure you that ours is far from the concept of the Garden of Eden. <laughs> Uh, it was a lot of work, and it still maintains a lot of work. But I, I really wonder, can you imagine a garden planted by God himself? That would be a garden. The beauty of it would be something that would be unsurpassed. God planted a garden, and that's where he put man, whom he had formed. 
And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So in this ground, and it is quite possible that in chapter 1 and verse 12, the trees that were created were most likely full-grown trees, and God also took and planted trees. Every tree imaginable, every tree that would be beautiful and pleasant to the sight. Those trees that would be good for food. We know that the dietary issues prior to uh, the flood, all of that was much different than it is today. God provided all of these things. But also God put in the midst of the garden two other trees. The tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life is ultimately that tree which would produce life. The tree of knowledge of good and evil would be that tree that would produce the experiential knowledge, the awareness of both good and evil. Does this mean that God is responsible for causing man to sin? Absolutely not. The Garden of Eden was an arena in which their obedience would ultimately be tested. If they would simply obey God, they could enjoy God's limitless blessings in a setting that is beyond imagination. But if they chose to disregard God's commandment, they would be faced to live, forced to live with the consequences of that decision. Verse 9 merely introduces two trees that, as we are familiar with the account, become very instrumental in this account. To say that God is responsible for causing man to sin is about as foolish as saying because God gave you a job, he is responsible for causing you to mishandle your money. It doesn't work. There is an element in which man is responsible to make the right choices. And God has in his divine wisdom enabled man to choose right and wrong. He has not forced us. We are not created as robots. We have an ability to choose what is right and what is wrong. But we will bear the consequences of those decisions. We will stand accountable for how we choose to do it. God did it this way. That's God's issue. We dare not say that God is responsible because of this for causing man to sin. Then in verses 10 through 14, you find the greater description of the design of this garden. A river went out of Eden to water the garden. From thence it was parted and became into four heads. It comes out of the garden and it divides itself into four rivers. The name of the first is Pison, that is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. There is delium and the onyx stone. Now, we are not clear exactly where these things are. If the geography was the same or similar anyway before the flood as it is today, it would appear that this region was somewhere in the Persian Gulf area. It also is possible that the rivers are no longer the same. A river typically over time does not just follow the same course. They change. They erode different sections and make different turns. That's the nature of water. But the Bible describes this river that flowed out of Eden. The first one was Pison, a river that is said to be in Havilah. This would be in north central Arabia. It would be east of Palestine. It was a very rich land of gold and delium and the onyx stone. There's another river. This is Gihon, and it was in an area that would be east of Mesopotamia. The same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And then the Bible says there is the name of the third river is Hittichel. This would be the, uh, similar to the Tigris River. It's the same concept, we believe. And that is it which goes toward the east of Assyria, and the fourth river is Euphrates. Now, you might be sitting here going, my goodness, I have no idea where any of those things are. It's okay. You don't need to. It's irrelevant. Remember what we talked about? The point of the details is not to get lost in the details. It's to understand what God created. Look at where they were. Look at the place that they were able to enjoy. They were placed in a garden of unprecedented beauty. 
Nothing has ever been seen like it. Now, there is coming a point in which the world that God creates will resemble very closely what was stated back here in Genesis 2. But you and I don't live in this kind of a world. Before I move on, let me point this out. There are those who will make all sorts of excuses as to why they did wrong. Some will say, the devil made me do it. We talked about that this morning in Galatians 5. There are others who say, well, you just don't understand how hard it is to live a godly life where I work. Or how hard it is to live a godly life when our culture bombards us with all of these things. In essence, what we're saying is not the devil made me do it. We're saying the environment made me do it. I didn't have a choice. You see, I work around people who are foul-mouthed, and so I just picked up those habits and started talking that way. Those of you who work in that kind of environment, and incidentally, if you have a secular job, you work in that kind of environment. You understand the very reality of what I just said. Those words that you hear do come into those ears and sometimes rattle around. But that does not mean it needs to come out of your mouth. You see, there's a choice that is there. For man to come along and, and blame their environment and say, well, I just can't because of all of these things. Adam and Eve were placed in the perfect environment and still chose to rebel against God. Your environment does not make you who you are. Your choices make you who you are. And you are responsible for them. You can't blame everyone else. You can look in the mirror and blame the person you see. Because you are responsible for the choices that you make. We see the position of man and the provision of man. Let's thirdly move on and see the expectation for man. So we're here in this great place. What does God want? The Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. The word put is kind of an interesting word. It would suggest that Adam was actually sent to rest in this garden. He was to tend it and he was to uh, dress it and keep it. Uh, the concept is that he was to serve in it. The word uh, keep would have the idea of tending or serving in it. You know, God put Adam in this garden to work. Sin hadn't entered the world yet. Work is not part of the curse. You might think it is because of your job, <laughs> okay, then change your job. The concept of work is God-ordained. It is not part of the curse. It is not a result of the fall. The labor that we sometimes have to do is part of the fall, and the things that we have to get out of our garden, for example, is part of the fall. But here was the means by which Adam could glorify God. Adam, this is what I'm asking you to do. Be here, tend to it, serve it, work in this, and glorify me in that process. Do you realize that that is exactly what God wants you to do with work? Amen. Until you realize, however, that work is a means by which you can ultimately glorify God, you probably are not going to. You'll dread it every day, talk poorly about those who require it, who make the rules, who make the decisions, who force these dumb things on you. It's a means by which you can choose to glorify God. Do bosses sometimes come up with dumb policies? Yes. Do workers sometimes come up with dumb policies? Yes. Do employees sometimes have dumb ideas about the policies? Yes. Okay. There are problems. You should be the manager of people who engage in dumb ideas, okay? And you have to now make policies to try to redirect dumb ideas. Uh, how many rules have been created because somebody thought that something dumb would be a good idea, 
Okay, it's amazing some of the policies that you read, such as snowblowers are not intended to work on roofs. Go figure. Okay, I just can't figure out what happened to my shingles. They were here one minute and the next minute they were gone. There's a reason for that. Can you imagine the person who decided this will be a good idea? Let's lug that snowblower up this ladder and we'll get it up on top of the roof and get those blades to spin it and we'll clear that roof off. This is a really good idea. Somebody decided to do that one day. And because they decided to do that, warnings have to be put that say this is not something you should do. Death or accidental injury is likely to occur. Go figure. What are you doing with a snowblower on top of your roof? <laughs> okay. This is not a good idea. But somebody thought that it was. And the world is full of those kinds of ideas. Hey, y'all, watch this. And it's a problem. And it's created all sorts of rules. And it's created all sorts of YouTube videos as well. And that's the sick part that we enjoy watching. Oh, hey, 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 look at this. Oh, man, ooh, that hurt. Oh, that's funny. And meanwhile, <laughs> the person who was lying in pain did not think that it was funny, but everyone else did. That's our humor for you, but nonetheless, um, I'm glad you all are laughing so that it's not just my humor, uh, <clears throat> but nonetheless, God gave some very clear commands. He said, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Adam, I give you every tree you want. Adam, you don't need anything else than what I've already given you. What I have given you is enough to sustain life. What I have given you is everything you need. There's one restriction. Don't eat of the tree of life. Or I'm sorry, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam, you've got all this. Don't do this. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. A very clear command and a very clear punishment. As we will see in Genesis chapter 3, human nature is naturally designed towards that thing which is forbidden. People say, well, I just don't understand. What were you thinking when you did such and such? You weren't. Sin does not make sense. It never has and it never will. We cannot rationalize it and explain it away. It just simply does not make sense. A person who can have all of this will take it and throw it away for this. Why? That's the nature of sin. Here you are in a garden that is unbelievable, Adam. Look at this place. Designed by me, planted by me. Just, just don't do this right here. Everything else you've got. Whoa, what a lesson. What a warning to us all. Verses 18 through 24 teach the provision of woman. The Lord God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help, notice two separate words, meet for him. People talk about a help meet and use this passage. It is a help who is meet, a help who is fitting for him. Adam, it's not good that man should be alone. And if you've had to be a bachelor, you understand this is not good. Okay, wife goes out of town. This is not good. Okay, I'm hungry. Uh, I've told my wife, as a, I won't go hungry. And I might spend money, but I will not go hungry. Uh, there's two things. That's the one thing that is just not going to happen. And if you can't look at me and tell that, then that's your own fault. And you get your eyes checked. Uh, but nonetheless, you look at it and say, Adam, this is not good. So I'm going to make a help meet for you. One that is fitting for you. Out of the ground, the Lord God, and he kind of reverts back to another aspect and probably how the solitude as Adam is working away. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field. That's pretty amazing when you think about this. Every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. <laughs> Did he call it in Latin? 
God knows Adam's the only one who could have read that, okay? Uh, this animal, uh, this plubius, whatever, and it's like, really? Okay, uh, that's a lion, okay? Yeah, I can figure that out, and you, you see. Adam gave names to all cattle, to the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found an help meat for him. Adam did all of these things, the cattle, as we talked about in Genesis 1, those uh, four-legged animals that would be domesticated, the fowl of the air, the beast of the field, the undomesticated animals, but for Adam, there was not found an help that was meat for him. Adam needed this. Men, you need it. That's how God designed it. Okay? This is not a sign of weakness or anything like this. This is how God designed it. Ladies, look at the role that you have an opportunity to play to your husband. God designed you to meet his needs. Some of you ladies are thinking, my goodness, he's got a lot of needs. <laughs> How in the world can I meet all of these needs? He's such a needy person. Well, to you men, grow up some, okay? Uh, don't be so needy. Man up a little bit. It's all right. Uh, you don't have to be a spineless jellyfish that's incapable of opening up the refrigerator door to get yourself something to drink, okay? And uh, yeah, those who, you know, it's, you know, it's her job to serve me. Yeah, she'll serve you something one day, <laughs> okay? Uh, you'd be a fool to drink it. So let me just tell you, you better be awfully careful uh, how you do it. Like one lady said, at some point in time, you'll go to sleep and it's up to me whether or not you wake up. Uh, every man since then sleeps with one eye open, okay? I'm not going to sleep, I'm not going to sleep. Uh, look, this is how God designed it. Now notice how God did this. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. Do you think there was any pain? I don't think so. Can you imagine having a rib taken out and no pain? Jill broke two ribs here a week and a half ago. She still is in pain. If you've had any kind of surgery, I don't care what they do, it hurts. And if you're a man who goes through surgery, it's like death, okay? Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's awful, okay? Uh, I mean, the ladies are all going, yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And you ladies, be careful. You bark up the wrong tree. But nonetheless, here Adam sleeps, and God pulls out this rib, and he makes a woman out of this. He didn't come, he didn't take her from the foot, indicating that Adam would have the opportunity to trample all over her. Nor did he remove this from the head, indicating that she could potentially rule over him. That's not God's design. And we live in an age of equality. Ladies, don't reduce it down to that. You have a unique opportunity and a unique role. It is a privilege to be able to be in the role that you are in. Don't let society taint this idea. Men, honor the wife. Honor that and, and lift them up and treat them with care and cherish them. That's how God's designed this. The Bible said in verse 22, The rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. I wonder what Adam first thought. <laughs> Whoa, man. I think that's what he thought. But anyway, some of you will get that later on. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Because she was taken out of man. Notice verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. When you get married, guess what happens? You leave mommy and daddy and you cleave. That's the biblical order of things. Mommy and daddy, let me caution you. If you don't like the decision they make, tough. They're responsible for making their decisions. You may not agree with it, you don't have to. You may not like it, you don't have to. You may accept it, that's great. They are the ones responsible for making their decisions. I do not answer to my parents any longer. I'm responsible for my home. I may seek advice, but I do not have to obey them. I do not have to live by their standard of discipline, by their standard of approval. It does not matter. I don't have to check my mail when they want me to check my mail. I don't have to check my mail if I don't want to check my mail. Why? Because I have created my own home. Men, same thing. When you got married, that's what happened. You said, I do, and you became one flesh. Parents have to allow that child to go. And they have to allow differences of opinion. Those are good things. 
Do not interfere with those decisions. Parents who do so are crossing a line that is unbiblical. Well, I just think they need to do that. Tough. You're not paid to think that anymore. It's not your responsibility. Oh, man, that's, that's really harsh. No, it's not. It's biblical. We created our family. We've got three girls. At some point in time, they are going to get married and they are going to move on. That is their decision, and it better not be soon. No, I'm teasing. All right. <laughs> we had to throw that in there. All right, I'm teasing. I have you and Aubrey back there. Aubrey's feeling about this tall right now. All right. So you go in and you look at these. This is how God's designed it. Okay? And this is how things function best. But I can tell you problems are inevitable when that interference takes place. It will destroy a marriage. Stay out of it and let them make their decisions. Those who have moved on and formed your own family, can I tell you, make wise decisions? <laughs> Don't be arrogant. Don't be, oh, this is my way. Don't be doing that stuff because you're going to make some dumb decisions. Use wisdom. Ask questions. Learn. Learn. But you are responsible to lead that family in a manner that honors God. And you're going to stand one day and give an account to him, not to mommy and daddy. Let me move on and continue with just simply the innocence of man. I want you to notice how everything was so wonderful. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Kids today read that and go, hee, hee, ha, that's funny. <laughs> Look at the innocence that is here. That is the world before sin. We don't live in an innocent culture today. We live in a culture that sexualizes virtually everything. And it's tragic. A simple comment can be made and it's taken to mean extremes that were never intended. We've lost our innocence. This was the environment God created. This was the environment that God designed. This was what God desired for his people to dwell in. Man, unfortunately, chose a different path. And that path was one that was in rebellion to God. But there's come a day when God is going to completely destroy this earth. Peter talks about the destruction by fire. And he will build a new heaven and a new earth. And man, is it going to be something. And it's going to be very similar to this. Only I believe on a much larger scale. This was a garden that will be a whole new world. God's going to be victorious. Meanwhile, this is the world in which we live. This is the world in which we function. So go honor God in it tomorrow. Glorify him. Set him apart. Be different from all those who are around you. And realize that when you defy God's order of things, you bring problems. Let's avoid those problems by living in obedience to his will.